In the words of Francis of Assisi, when he met Brother Dominic on the road to Umbria, hi. I was down at the uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, and the student comes up to me and says, neat jeans, man, neat. For an old goat, you're cool. You're cool, man. For an old goat, you're cool. And I says to him, if you ain't cool, what is the point of going on? <laughs> then I'm right in his face, and I said, give me one reason why I should go slogging through the molasses of this dark, dreary, dismal world if you ain't cool. And he looks at me, backs off, and he says, geez, uh, it ain't that bad, man. Uh, uh, why don't you go talk to the chaplain? So the theme of what I want to share tonight is the new criterion for being cool. What does it mean to be cool in Christ Jesus? A group of five computer salesmen from Milwaukee went to a regional sales convention in Chicago. They're all married men. <laughs> all right. And they all assured their wives they'd be home in ample time for dinner. The meeting in Chicago runs late. Guys race out of the building, head down toward the train station. They see their train back to Milwaukee slowly starting to chug along the tracks. The guys go racing through the train station. Inadvertently, one of them kicked over a table on which rested a basket of apples. There was a 10-year-old boy there selling apples to pay for his books and clothes for school. But with a sigh of relief, the five guys clamber aboard the train, but one of them felt a twinge of compassion for the kid whose apple stand had overturned. So he said to the other four, when you get back to Milwaukee, call my wife, tell her I'm gonna be about an hour and a half late, I'll catch the next train. He walked back into the train station, and later he said, I'm really glad I did, because a 10-year-old boy was blind. Well, the apples are scattered all over the floor. This computer salesman starts to pick them up. He noticed several were bruised. So he reached in his pocket, and he said to the blind boy, Here's $20 for the apples we damaged. Hope it didn't spoil your day. God bless you. He started to walk away, and the blind boy called after him and asked, Are you Jesus? Who is this Jesus who is such a magnetic field for so many people and a stumbling block for many others? Who is this obscure Nazarene carpenter in whose name reforms, renewals, revivals, crusades have been launched, whose name has filled libraries with brilliant scholarship, whose name our very calendars numbered B.C., the days before Christ walked the earth, A.D., Anno Domino, the days since Jesus rose to the Father. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Tonight, I'd like to share from one of those eight or ten passages in the Gospels that's had a profound impact on my personal life and led to a more intimate and heartfelt understanding of Jesus as saving Lord. We're in chapter 12 of Matthew, and the Abba of Jesus, his heavenly Father, is pointing to him and saying these words of his son using the mouth of the prophet Isaiah to deliver them. Here is my servant whom I have chosen my beloved, the favorite of my soul. I will endow him with my spirit, and he will proclaim the true faith to the nations. He will not brawl or shout, nor will his voice be heard in the streets. The bruised reed he will not crush, and the smoldering wick he will not quench until he has led the truth to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. An old Hasidic rabbi, Levi Yichek of Berdachev in the Ukraine, claimed that he learned the meaning of love from a drunken peasant. One morning, the rabbi was out in the Polish countryside to visit a friend of his who owned a tavern. When the rabbi walked in, he saw two men 
seated at a table, both gloriously in their cups, drunk as skunks, stoned out of their minds, arms wrapped around each other, each guy was reassuring the other one how much he loved him. Suddenly, Ivan said to Peter, Peter, tell me what hurts me. And bleary-eyed, Peter said, how do I know what hurts you? Ivan's answer was swift. If you don't know what hurts me, how can you say you love me? What made Jesus of Nazareth the greatest lover in human history is that he really knew and he really knows tonight what hurts his people. A close friend of mine, an Episcopal priest in Columbus, Ohio, walked into his office at the church on a Monday morning in 1981. He wrote a hasty letter of resignation to the vestry. Then he went back to his home, sat down at the kitchen table, and wrote a letter to his wife and his three kids, all the children under the age of 10, that he was abandoning them. He fled to a logging camp in New England, took a job in Vermont as a logger, and one Saturday afternoon in January, it was about 10 below zero, the priest was sitting in this portable aluminum trail that he'd rented. The only source of heat was a tiny portable aluminum heater. Well, the heater suddenly quit and died. Within minutes, the temperature in the trailer was below zero. Shivering in a fit of rage, the priest picked up the heater, flung it through the window, broke the window, and shouted, Christ, I hate you. Damn you, God, get out of my life. I'm finished with this Christian crap. It's all over. He sank to his knees, defeated and weeping. And in the bright darkness of faith, he heard a voice from within say, it's okay, Kevin. I understand. I'm here. I'm with you. And I'm for you. Then he heard Jesus weeping within him. Christ felt what he was feeling. It was an overwhelming experience of intimacy. That same afternoon, Kevin Martin packed his bags, returned to Columbus to be reconciled with his family and his church, and went on to pastor the most dynamic, alive, spirit-filled Episcopal Church in America, St. Luke's in Seattle, Washington. You read the Gospels carefully. You notice how fine-tuned Jesus is to our sense of loneliness, our fears, our anxiety, our emptiness, our desolation, as well as he's tuned into our joy and our consolation. That he really knows what hurts the human heart, shows up both through his public ministry on earth, with the sinful woman, the home of Simon the Pharisee, with the adulterous woman in danger of stoning, with the thrice-denying Peter on Easter night, with the 23-year-old John on the night before he died, with the women who been along the road to Calvary, it shows up in all those passages that describe Jesus as, quote, having compassion. The Greek verb splachnitsomai is used in the 12 times in the four Gospels and is usually translated to English as he was moved with compassion. However, because of the poverty of our English vocabulary, we really don't capture the deep etymological meaning of splachnitsomai. So depending upon the translation of the Bible you use, it may say he was moved with pity, or he felt sorry for them, or his heart went out to them. But again, they missed the profound physical and emotional flavor of this Greek verb, splachnitsomai, which is derived from the noun splachna, meaning bowels, entrails, intestines, the deepest parts of a person from which the strongest emotions like love and hatred arise. We must never forget that when we speak of the compassion of Jesus, we are speaking of the compassion of the infinite, transcendent, almighty God, of the sacred man defined by the Council of Nicaea as being co-equal and consubstantial to the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. What I'm saying is this, the compassion of Jesus is the compassion of Almighty God, and Jesus says to your heart and mine tonight, don't ever be so foolish as to measure my compassion for you in terms of your compassion for one another. Don't ever be so silly as to compare your thin, pallid, wavering, capricious, fickle, moody, dependent on smooth circumstances, human compassion with mine, for I am God as well as man. What I'm driving at is this. 
when you read in the Gospels that Jesus was moved with compassion, it is saying his gut was wrenched, his heart torn open, the most vulnerable part of his being laid bare. Spagnitima in Greek is related to the Hebrew word for compassion, rakamim, which refers to the womb of Yahweh. Compassion is such a deep, central, powerful emotion in Jesus that can only be described as a movement within the womb of God himself where all the divine tenderness and gentleness lie hidden, where God is mother, father, brother, sister, son and daughter, where feelings, emotions and passions are one in divine love. When Jesus was moved with compassion, when he wept within the brokenness of my priest friend Kevin Martin, the gospel is saying the ground of all being shook, the source of all life trembled, the heart of all love burst open, and the unfathomable depths of the relentless tenderness that is my free transition spagnisimai was laid bare. The numerous physical healings performed by Jesus and recorded in the Gospels are only a hint, only a hint of the anguish in the heart of God's Son for our wounded humanity. If there's one thing I've learned in the 43 years since I was first ambushed by Jesus, in a little chapel up in Loretto, Pennsylvania, on February 8th of 1956. There's one thing I've learned, it's this. If you call Jesus goodness, he'll be good to you. If you call him love, he'll be loving to you. But if you call him compassion, he will know that you know. As the 14th century mystic Meister Eckhart said, the best name for the Nazarene carpenter is Son of Compassion. When we speak of Jesus as Emmanuel, as God with us, we are saying the greatest lover in history really knows what hurts us. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that Jesus does not understand about the pain that hangs like a darkening cloud over the valley of human history in his own flesh. He feels every separation and loss, every heart broken, every wound of the spirit that refuses to close, or the riven experience of men, women, and children across the bands of time. If there is anybody sitting here tonight who is crying out for a hand that will touch them, an arm that will embrace them, lips that will kiss them, who's longing for somebody who's not afraid of your cynicism, your skepticism, your indifference, your Christ I hate, you get out of my life, there comes a sacred man in our midst who says, it's okay, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm for you, and your pain reverberates in the depth of my own being. My friends, this is not pious poetry. This is the meaning of Easter. Easter did not remove Jesus from us. It simply made it possible for him to touch not only Niam, but New Orleans, not only Mary Magdalene, but me. Your Christian life and mine don't make any sense unless in the depth of our beings we believe that Jesus not only knows what hurts us, but knowing seeks us out whatever our poverty, whatever our pain. His plea to his people is tonight his promise to us, come to me. Come to me, not to church, not to a Bible study, not to an annual conference, but you come to me. And don't wait till you got your head on straight, your act cleaned up, you're free of sin, selfishness, dishonesty, degraded love. But come now, wounded, frightened, angry, lonely, empty, depressed, tilting toward despair, and I'll meet you where you live. And I'll love you as you are, not as you should be, because you're never going to be as you should be. Do you really believe this? That with all the wrong turns you made in your past, the mistakes, the detours, the moments of selfishness, dishonesty, and degraded love, all the ways you've used the ministry to fill up your own personal needs, that God has used them all to bring where you are tonight, and the word says you are standing on holy ground. This moment, do you really believe that Jesus Christ loves you? Not the person next to you, not Mother Teresa, not Billy Graham, not the church, not the world, but that he loves you beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity, 
that he loves you in the morning sun and the evening rain, without caution, regret, boundary, limit, breaking point, no matter what's gone down, he can't stop loving you. This is the Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus of my own journey. This is not something I read in a book or heard in a sermon. This is the Christ that by the grace of God I've met in my own life. It was about 24 years ago. Funny, April Fool's Day, 1975. I woke up in a doorway on Commercial Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I woke up in an alcoholic fog, sniffing vomit all over my sweater, standing down on my bare feet, didn't know a wine had stolen my shoes, stole, stole my shoes during the night to buy a bottle of Thunderbird. I've been out in the street about three weeks, sleeping on the beach until the cops caught me, under the bridge, in doorways. I was panhandling enough money to get a quart of vodka every day. Same filthy clothes, rancid body odor. And I lived to drink. And that morning I woke up in the f alcoholic fog and I see a woman coming down the sidewalk, maybe 25 years old, blonde hair, attractive lady. She got a four-year-old son in her hand. The boy broke loose from his mother's grip, ran over to the doorway and stared down at me. His mother came up quickly behind him, cupped her hand over his eyes and said, don't look at that filth. All that is is pure filth. And about 24 years ago, that filth was Brennan Manning. And the God I've come to know, the Jesus I have met in my own life, loved me as much that morning in a state of disgrace as he does tonight in the state of grace, for his compassion is never Never, never based on our performance. It knows no shadow of alteration or change. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy, the bruised reed of your life. He will not crush, and the smoldering wick he will not quench until he's led the truth of your life story to victory. This night, will you let Jesus come to you on his terms? Will you let him love you as you are and not as you should be? Because nobody in this ballroom is as they should be. I've not asked a Christian in 20 years, do you know that Jesus loves you who's not replied? Oh, yes, I know that. And 99% don't know it. Except in some vague, distant, abstract way. They'd be hard-pressed to say that right now, the essence of their Christian life is a love affair. And not just a simple love affair, but a furious love affair going on between Christ and themselves at this very moment. I live in New Orleans and my doorbell rang the summer before last. I open it. It's a woman about 35 years old. She asks, are you Brennan Manning? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, obviously we've never met. Uh, I was given your name by a, a friend and I was hoping that uh, I was just wondering if she started to cry. I said, uh, how can I help you? She said, my daddy's at home dying of cancer. I've asked the pastor of my own church three times to go and pray with him. He said he promised that he will, but then he gets so caught up in his own sermon preparation, his administrative agenda, he forgets. I don't think my daddy has long to live. Could you come and pray with him? I said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. I get over to the man's house. I walk back into his bedroom. He's lying on his bed. His head is propped up on two pillows. There's an empty chair beside his bed. I said, hi, guess you expected me. He said, no, sir, who are you? I said, honest mistake, I saw the empty chair. I thought you were expecting company. He said, oh, yeah, the chair. Are you mind closing the door? I closed his bedroom door, wondering myself, what is going on here? This little guy says to me, Brennan, I've never told anybody this in my whole life, even my daughter. But all my life, I've never known how to pray. Go to church on Sunday. My pastor talks in prayer, goes right over my head. Finally, one Sunday, I get the courage to say to my pastor, I get zero, zilch, out of your sermons on prayer. <laughs> he reaches in his desk drawer, takes out this book and says, here, read this. It's by Hans Urs von Balthasar, Swiss theologian, best book on contemporary prayer of the 20th century. He said, Brennan, I take the book home. The first three pages, I gotta look up 11 words in the dictionary. Next Sunday, I give the book back to my pastor saying, thank you very much, under my breath for nothing. 
And that day, I abandoned any attempt at prayer till one day, four years ago, my best friend, who I don't think is very spiritual, says to me out of the blue, you know, Joe, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. What you do is you sit down in a chair, you place an empty chair in front of you, in faith, see Jesus on the chair, and he's there because he promised, I'll be with you every day until the end of time, then just speak to him and listen, as you would in a conversation with your best friend. This old guy says to me, Brandon, I've been doing that two hours a day now, the last four years. I love to do it. I'm careful, in fact, cautious. I don't want my daughter to see me talk to an empty chair, you know. She'd say, funny farm for daddy. But uh, you got a background in this. You think it's prayer? I said, Joe, you don't have to ask me. That is so simple, so unsophisticated, so honest, so open, so real. That delights the heart of Jesus. He said, yeah. I anoint him with oil. I pray with him. I go back to my house. And two nights later, his daughter returns to tell me her daddy died that afternoon. I asked, did he seem to die in peace? She said, yes, but I left the house at 2 o'clock to go to the store. He called me over his bedside, told me one of his corny jokes, and he kissed me on the cheek. When I got back just before 3, I found him dead. But she said, Brennan, strange, beyond strange. This is weird. At the moment my daddy died, he leaned over and put his head on an empty chair beside his bed. Do you know that, Jesus? Not about him, but do you know him? Is this the way that you relate to him? You know the most heartbreaking thing in my ministry? Is to travel this country from Maine to California, 10 times a year, back and forth, all kinds of stops in between. I meet Christians, young, middle-aged, they tell me they're born again, or they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, or they pray in tongues, or they're deep into the Word, but they've never once laid their head on the empty chair. Somehow that's too threatening, that's too intimate. But that's the very meaning of the central mystery of our faith, the Incarnation. The Incarnation is the mystery of the compassionate closeness of God in Jesus of Nazareth. He draws near to us and speaks to us in words of incredible familiarity. My little children, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come back and take you with me that where I am, you also may be. Bart, Marty, Michael, Sean, Gloria, you. When was the last time anybody ever addressed you as my little child? This is Jesus speaking to grown men, my little children. I'm not going to leave you orphans. That Jesus is the same yesterday in Galilee, tonight in Philadelphia, forever in the kingdom says, my little children, I'm not leaving you orphans. I get an invitation to do a weekend retreat up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, for a group called the Soaring Singles. This is 90 people. You had to be in your 20s and single to qualify. Well, I get the invitation, I say to myself, what a lightweight weekend this is going to be. They're going up there to play Kissy Face and Huggy Bear. And they just want me to mention Jesus every half hour to give it some legitimacy. But I say to myself, eh, I'm in a mood for a lightweight weekend. So up I go. Saturday night, we're in the great room. It's 55 below zero outside with the wind chill factor. And I was driven to my knees by the hunger of these young people for God. And that night, it just happened, I was speaking on these words of Jesus, my little children, I will not leave you orphans. The moment I said orphans, a 26-year-old Cambodian guy let out a scream and he bolted out the door. Well, we were all shocked. These young people said, Brennan, what happened? I said, I don't know, but if he's not back in 15 seconds, drag him and he's going to freeze to death out there. He walks back in, comes up and he stands beside me and he asks, Brennan, 
I say a few words. He said, please. He says to the group, none of you here know me. Twelve years ago in Cambodia, my father learned that the Khmer Rouge, a terrorist organization, were on the way to our village. My father got me out of bed. We slipped through the jungle, we got out to the ocean. My father strapped me to an open raft and pushed me out into the sea. I guess it was a miracle, he said, but I was picked up by some Korean fisherman. Later, I made my way here to the States. Two years ago, I got my MBA from Harvard. And now I live in Chicago uh, in an apartment by myself. I've had no word from my mother, my father, or my two sisters in 12 years. I went back to Cambodia. I couldn't find them. Nobody ever heard of them. I have lived in your country like an orphan. And then I saw your ad in the newspaper for a retreat for single people. And I came here hoping I would meet a, maybe make a friend. I don't know your Jesus. I heard he was a wise man, even a prophet. But Brennan, when you said my little, his word, my little children, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I don't know what happened. But out of nowhere, your Jesus was in my face. And that word was like a cutting knife. It was rolling thunder. It was an earthquake in the world of my spirit. I know him. I know him. I sense his presence. He's here. Yes, he's here. The Jesus who says, why do I share this? I didn't come way up here from the tropical weather of New Orleans to the tundra of Philadelphia. To mince words or beat around the bush or indulge in wistful things or pass on nice thoughts or inspiring ideas. The day you surrender in faith, in unwavering trust, in reckless confidence to the compassion of Jesus over your life, I promise you, every trace of shame, guilt, remorse, self-hatred, self-condemnation will vanish from your life. Jesus Christ is not simply a bit of information in the Bible. He is the transformation, the transforming power of God. And this night when you surrender, in your brokenness, in your sinfulness, in your darkness, in your emptiness, in your phoniness, when you come to Jesus and say, here I am, it's all I got. And let Jesus come to you on his terms. Let him come to you as the son of compassion. Let him bring healing to your heart. Total forgiveness for every sin of your past life. Let Jesus be who he is, your savior. The Jesus who says, my little children, I'm not gonna leave you orphans, is not just some great teacher or some model for us to imitate. His words resonate with the deepest affection. And he offers himself to you and me as companion for the journey, as a friend who is never rude, always patient with our failings, quick to forgive, his love keeps no score of our wrongdoing. This is an awesome dimension of discipleship, and the Christian scriptures lay great emphasis on it. What deity, any great world religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, would ever dare to say what Jesus says in John 15? Make your home in me as I make mine in you. Abide in me as I abide in you. If any one of you love me, you'll be true to my word, and my Father will love you, will come to you, will make our home within you. I tell you solemnly, I'll be with you every day of your life until the end of time. Lo, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open, I'll come in, sit down beside you, and have supper with you. Now, if you know anything about the Orthodox Jewish tradition, when an Orthodox Jew, which Jesus was, says, I want to have supper with you, he is saying, I want to enter into friendship with you. In 1999, an Orthodox Jew still defines a friend, quote, as someone who breaks bread with you. Today, an Orthodox Jew will have a cup of coffee with you, a donut. Probably not a hot dog unless it's kosher. But if he says, I want to have supper with you, he is saying, Come to my mikdash mayat, my miniature sanctuary, my dining room table, and they will celebrate the most sacred experience of all life affords, friendship. This is Jesus, Lord, Messiah, Christ. It is God himself saying, I'm knocking. I'll never intrude. 
I'll never impose my grace, my miracles, my presence. Only your, my love, which you're free to reject it. But if you open the door of your heart, I'll come in and sit down, not across the table, but by your side. You can lay your head on my breast, as John did in the upper room. We'll break the bread of friendship. And then that awesome line, maybe the most stunning sentence in the entire Bible, Jesus says, I don't call you servants. A servant doesn't know what his master's doing. I call you my friend. St. Augustine's commentary in that one sentence was, a friend is someone who knows everything about you and still totally accepts you. Not in spite of all your faults, that wouldn't be total acceptance, but with them all. Isn't this the dream we all share? Someday, somewhere, I'm going to meet that person who really understands me, the words I speak, and even understands the words I leave unspoken. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that dream, and that is why for me, Paul Tillich's definition of faith is the most meaningful of all. Tillich defines faith as the courage to accept acceptance. Faith is the courage to accept the acceptance of Jesus Christ. That right now, it means to surrender in a wavering trust that Jesus knows your whole life story, every skeleton in your closet, every moment of sin has darkened your past life, knowing right now your shallow faith, your feeble prayer life, your empty heart, loves you and accepts you just as you are. Tillich says, you can pray the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ is the Lord, until you blue in the face, but until the day dawns that you accept that you're accepted, you're not yet a believer. Will you let Jesus come to you tonight on his own terms and let him be who he is? The fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy, the bruised reed of your life, he won't crush. And the smoldering wick, he won't quench until he's at the truth of your life story to victory. I wrote a newsletter recently to some friends around the country, and I wrote in it, a friend is someone who stands with you in the bad weather of life. And that's a sense that pregnant with meaning for me. A friend is someone who stands with you in the bad weather of life. Back in 1973, when I went out, out as a drunken bum, I was in the gutter for 18 months down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. With alcohol, a total compulsion of my body, a complete obsession of my mind. My family, I lost them. My friends wanted nothing to do with me. I was such an embarrassment, such a source of shame. And my closest male friend in Mobile, Alabama, Paul Sheldon, every two weeks he flew at his own expense from Mobile down to Fort Lauderdale. And he sat on the curb in the gutter with me, with his arm around me. He didn't give me any lectures. He didn't uh, make, give me any ultimatums. He just said, Brennan, I love you. And you're going to be OK. And twice a month, for a year and a half, he was down there, just sitting with me, buying me some breakfast, just holding my hand. And for me, Paul Sheldon was the human face of Jesus Christ. You are never more Christ-like than when you are choked with compassion for the brokenness of others. You are never more like Jesus than when you are choked with compassion for the brokenness of others. Oh, I just thought of some. This is just an insight into Paul Sheldon and the insight he's given me into Jesus. Paul and I, to this day, we meet once a month. In fact, we're meeting this Tuesday uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi. That's midway between Mobile, where he lives, and New Orleans, where I live. And Paul is a banker, and married, four kids. So being a banker, he always gets to the beach before me. Now, he's down by the water, and he's splashing his feet in the water. He's got a, a pair of cutoffs and a T-shirt. And I come across, I park my car up in the beach road, I come walking across the sand and I yell, Paul. He turns around. Literally, this is what he does. He jumps, Brennan, wow. 
comes running across the sand, grabs me, kisses me on the lips for about 10 seconds, wraps his arm around me. We go down, we take a two and a half hour walk on the beach, then go to Mary Mahoney's for a festive dinner, and we go home. Jesus said, I don't call you a servant. I call you my friend. Wow! There you are. Oh. Will you let Jesus be who he is? Yeah. Let me close by sharing something I learned from an old evangelical pastor in northern Minnesota. In his house one night having dinner, doorbell rings. It's a 28-year-old man from his church. The man says, Pastor, you probably don't know me. I've only been coming to the church now for about three months. We've got a lot of members, but I've heard you speak three times on the compassion of Christ. Now, I believe every word you say, but it's all a head trip. Nice thoughts, lovely ideas. I've never felt that. I've never experienced the compassion of Christ. Any way you could help me? Pastor said, come into my study, invites me to take along. Pastor leads a short prayer, and he says to the 28-year-old, listen carefully to what I'm going to say. Jesus, the risen Lord, is in this room right now as the three of us gather in his name. Do you believe that he's true to his promise, faithful to his word, that he's in this room with us? I'm not asking a rhetorical question. Do you believe he's here? Well, a minute passed. The 28-year-old said, yes, I do believe that. All right now, said the pastor, listen very, very carefully to the words I'm about to say because they are the core of the Christian life. They are the essence of the good news. They are the heartbeat of discipleship. Jesus, the risen Christ, with us this moment, right here, right now, loves you and accepts you just as you are. You do not have to change to get his love. You do not have to give up your sin. You do not have to have a conversion experience. Obviously, Jesus wants you to change. Yes, he wants you to give up your sin, your selfishness, be converted and live and experience the freedom of the children of God. But you don't have to do that to get his love and acceptance. You have that already before you decide to change and whether you decide to change or not. Do you believe this? I want utter honesty. If you don't believe it, tell me. Come back in a month, we'll talk again. A full five minutes passed. Finally, the 28-year-old said, yes, yes, I do believe that. All right, now, said the pastor, say something to Jesus. Either say it aloud or in a silence beyond words. Spontaneously, the man began to pray aloud. He reached out, he grabbed the pastor's wrist, and he said, yes, yes, now I know. I know that I know that I know. He is here. I feel his presence. Right now, would you all please gently close your eyes and enter into this same experience. Reflect on the truth that Jesus is dwelling within you in your own simple, honest, unsophisticated words. Just make a simple act of faith that you trust in Jesus' indwelling presence within you. Now reflect on this stunning, saving truth that Jesus loves you as you are and not as you should be. He knows all your weaknesses, all your faults, all your hang-ups, all your character defects, nothing is hidden from his eyes. And he says, I love you as you are, not as you should be. Now see Jesus looking at you, and eye contact here is important. This does not require any great gift for visualization 
or imagination, but in faith, see Jesus looking at you. How is he looking at you? The way he looked at the sinful woman, the home of Simon the Pharisee, this woman, a notorious public sinner, a prostitute, hears that Jesus is having dinner in the home of Simon the Pharisee. Throwing caution to the wind, she goes, opens the door, and for the first time in her life, she lays her eyes on Jesus, and she is awed, overcome by the compassion, the gentleness that streams from his face. She walks right down the center of the room, kneels at his feet, and without saying a word, begins to wash his feet with her tears, dry them with her hair. And Jesus looks at her tenderly and says, your many sins are forgiven. Great is your love for me. Or does Jesus look at you the way he looked at the Apostle Peter on Easter night? It's a little more than 48 hours since Peter has three times denied ever even knowing the one man who loved him most. In the courtyard of Caiaphas, early on Good Friday morning, Peter had become a sniveling coward when a servant girl says, you're one of his followers, and Peter vehemently three times shouts, I don't know the man. And now Jesus walks through the door of the upper room. It's Easter night. Peter sees him, retreats to the corner, overcome with guilt and fear and shame. Jesus walks up over to him, raises him up, embraces him, kisses him on one cheek, then the other, and says, Shalom, my friend. Shalom. Be at peace. And then in the subtlest act of affirmation possible, Jesus appoints the coward Peter as the leader of the apostolic church. Or does Jesus look at you the way he looked at the adulterous woman? As the Pharisees drift away, Jesus asks her, ask her, is nobody here to condemn you? She says, no one, sir. And when she looks into Jesus' eyes, she sees heaven there. She never dreamed a man could love like this. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now let my love for you be so alive within you that never again will you want to seek love in the wrong arms or to seek happiness in the wrong places. Or does Jesus look at you the way he looked at the Apostle John, the upper room the night before he died, in an incredible gesture of intimacy, this 23-year-old kid lays his head on the chest of Jesus. And Jesus turns and looks, it doesn't say at John, but at the disciple that he loved. No doubt Jesus looks at you, he's never looked at any other human being, because we're each a unique and irreplaceable personality. But however Jesus looks at you, his eyes are filled with immense compassion. For the bruised reed he will not crush. The smoldering wick you will not quench. If this next word causes a movement, a stirring in your heart, accept it not as a word of encouragement from Brennan Manning, but as a healing, life-giving, transforming word from the risen Jesus. My friend, were you so naive as to think that your relationship with me would be an unbroken, upward spiral toward holiness. Don't you know that I'm too realistic for that? I witnessed a Peter who claimed he didn't know me, a James who wanted power and return for service to the kingdom, a Philip who did not know he was supposed to see the Father in me, and scores of disciples who were convinced that I was finished on Calvary. Yes, the Gospel has many examples of men and women who started out well, and then faltered along the way. But on Easter night I appeared to Peter. James is not remembered for his ambition, but for the sacrifice of his life for the kingdom. Philip did see the Father in me when I pointed the way, and the disciples who despaired had enough courage to recognize me and the stranger at their side when I broke bread with him in the gathering darkness at the end of the road to Emmaus. The point, my friend, is this. 
I expected more failure from you than you expected from yourself. Do you hear my word? I expected more failure from you than you expected from yourself. This moment, take your eyes off yourself, fix them on me, and let me be who I am. Savior. As the Holy Spirit moves in your heart, respond to the compassionate call of Jesus. If you're comfortable, pray aloud or communicate with him in a silence beyond words. Or come up here and just kneel down by the stage or just lay your head on the empty chair.
I'd like to uh, strongly encourage you tonight before you go to bed to spend five minutes praying Psalm 103 tonight. Night prayer, Psalm 103. And when you wake up tomorrow morning, let your morning prayer be Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. Night prayer tonight, Psalm 103. Morning prayer tomorrow, Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. And now I'll close with a blessing written by my spiritual director in New Orleans, Larry Hine. May all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness that you may experience the powerlessness and poverty of a child and sing and dance in the compassion of God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. In the words of Francis of Assisi, when he parted company with Brother Dominic on the road to Umbria, bye.